Hi everybody, welcome to my YouTube channel Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts and my FB page Dr. Srinivas Concepts. This is Dr. Srinivas, Neurophysician from Rajmandri, Andhra Pradesh, India. I am also the medical author of the two books Focus Neurology and Exam Oriented Clinical Neurology. My email is sriklpm at gmail.com. We are continuing with a series of lectures of Prime Neurology. There are going to be about 50 episodes of Prime Neurology and if one listens to all these 50 episodes of Prime Neurology, one would have acquired a good knowledge of Neurology. Right now we are on part 33 of Prime Neurology, Prime Neurology part 33, Peripheral Neuropathy. In this episode, we will basically di discuss the symptoms of Peripheral Neuropathy. So, what are the symptoms of the peripheral neuropathy? First, what is peripheral neuropathy? The peripheral nervous system includes all neural, all neural structures lying outside the pile membrane of the spinal cord and brainstem with the exception of the optic nerves and olfactory bulbs which are basically special extensions of the brain. The peripheral neuropathy may be accurately defined as the part of the nervous system that is invested by the cytoplasm and membranes of Schwann cells. Peripheral neuropathy happens when the peripheral nerves are damaged. The pathologic reactions of the peripheral nerves. Basically, we have three types. One is the valerian degeneration. Second is the segmental demyelination third is the axonal degeneration so this is a normal peripheral nerve so you can see here there is a nerve cell body nucleus this is the axon the center part this is the internode this is the node of ranvier this is the schwann cell which is responsible for myelination this is the nucleus this is the motor end plate and this is the muscle so this is a diagram of the basic pathologic process affecting the peripheral nerves what happens in valerian degeneration in valerian degeneration there is a degeneration of the axis cylinder and myelin distal to the site of axonal interruption. So, this arrow. So, there is a degeneration of the axis cylinder and the myelin distal to the site of axonal interruption arrow and then central chromatolysis. So, this is the valerian degeneration distal to the site of axonal interruption. Then we have the segmental demyelination in which the axon is spared only thing is the myelin sheath is affected and finally we have the axonal degeneration there is a distal degeneration of myelin and axis cylinder as a result of neuronal disease both valerian degeneration and axonal degeneration cause muscle atrophy so now let's talk about the symptomatology of peripheral nerve disease we will talk about the motor functions, we will talk about the sensory functions and the autonomic functions. First, let us talk about the impairment of motor function. What happens in the axonal neuropathy and what happens in the demyelinated neuropathy? In axonal neuropathy, it is characterized by relatively symmetric distribution of weakness that is distal because the pathologic changes begin in the far distal parts of the largest and the longest nerves and advance along the affected nerves towards their, cent towards their nerve cell bodies, dying back neuropathy. This represents the length dependent pattern that is typical of axonal degeneration. So, in axonal degeneration, the distal parts are more affected than the proximal parts. First, we, if you see the length of the leg nerves are more than the length of the arm nerves, hand nerves. So, the distal most parts, that is the foot gets affected. As the weakness starts getting affected, as the weakness starts spreading, it comes from the foot and starts ascending till the level of the knee. Once the knees get affected, the hand, uh, the hand also, nerves also start getting affected because it is length dependent neuropathy. So, first the distal parts of the feet get affected, then it slowly starts ascending and as it comes to the knee, the hand muscles also start becoming weak. Same thing applies to the sensory disturbances also because it is a length dependent neuropathy. 
atrophy of weak or paralyzed muscles is characteristic there is atrophy that is wasting of the muscles so in axonal degeneration one there is a length dependent neuropathy the distal parts get affected more than the proximal parts and it starts ascending and then there is weakness and then there is a waste, wasting atrophy of the weak or paralyzed muscle is characteristic when it comes to the demyelinated neuropathy it's a multifocal nature of the lesions and the blockage of electrical conduction often leads to weakness of the proximal muscles and the facial muscles before or at the same time as the distal muscles are affected classic example is gulen bari syndrome in gulen bari syndrome what happens the proximal parts and the distal parts are almost affected at the same time and the facial nerves get affected so they'll have the facial neuropathy also so this is an example of gulen bari syndrome demyelinated neuropathy the multifocal nature of the lesions and blockage of electrical conduction often leads to weakness of the proximal limb and facial muscles before or at the same time as distal parts are affected there is a relative sparing of muscle bulk because of the absence of denervation so there are two important differences between axonal neuropathy and demyelinated neuropathy one in axonal neuropathy it is a length dependent neuropathy distal parts get affected more than proximal parts and it becomes a graded uh, weakness whereas in demyelinated neuropathy both proximal parts and, and distal parts get affected equally along with the facial muscles second there is severe wasting in axonal neuropathy whereas there is no atrophy or wasting in the demyelinated neuropathy the classic example is gulen bari syndrome what happens to the tendon reflexes we have the large fibers ca carrying the position joint vibration sense we have the small fibers carrying the pain and temperature sense in large fiber neuropathy the tendon reflexes are lost due to the dependence of the afferent component of the tendon reflex on the large heavily myelinated fibers that originate in the muscle spindles whereas in small fiber neuropathy the tendon reflexes may be retained even with marked loss of perception of painful stimuli so in large fiber neuropathy which carries position joint and vibration sense which are the main afferent component of the tendon reflex when it gets affected tendon reflexes are lost whereas in spinal whereas in small muscle fiber neuropathy which carries pain and temperature sensation which is not responsible for the afferent sensations of the tendon reflex and therefore the tendon reflexes are retained or they are not affected so in large fiber neuropathy the tendon reflex are lost whereas in small fiber neuropathy the tendon reflexes may be retained now let's talk about the sensory symptoms what happens in the axonal neuropathy the small fiber neuropathy large fiber neuropathy and sensory ganglionopathy in axonal neuropathy as it worsens there is a spread of sensory loss from the distal to more proximal parts of the limbs and eventually to the anterior abdomen thorax and the face as i said it is a dying back phenomenon length dependent neuropathy axonal neuropathy so first the foot gets affected so there is a stocking type of sensory loss then as it ascends it goes to the knee once it starts affecting the knee the hand sensory disturbance also will start appearing because then the length becomes equal from the hip to the knee and from the shoulder joint to the hand it becomes equal so once it starts hitting the knee then the sensory disturbance also will start spreading from the hand so it's a length dependent small fiber neuropathy as i said it carries pain and temperature sense and therefore in small fiber neuropathy pain and temperature may be far impaired in large fiber neuropathy it carries joint position vibration sense so they are more impaired but then they can have painful dysesthesias thermal and painful dysesthesias may be due to large loss of large touch spreader fibers which disinhibits the pain receiving nerve cells in the posterior horns of the spinal cord so in large fiber neuropathy there are generally painful dysesthesias why there are painful dysesthesias when the large fi large fiber generally inhibit the impulses carried by small fibers and therefore when the large fibers are affected the impulses carried by small fibers are disinhibited and what are the impulses carried by small fibers pain and therefore they will have painful dysesthesias so in large fiber neuropathy there will be thermal and painful dysesthesias because of disinhibition of the small fibers then we have the sensory ganglionopathy that means dorsal root ganglia gets affected the sensory loss affects the trunk scalp and face and is the result of the simultaneous dysfunction of all parts of the sensory nerve then there are deformity and trophic changes 
there is pescavus, high arch foot, the scyphos coliosis, where there is a curvature of the spine. The pescavus, high arch foot and scyphos coliosis occur when the disease begins during childhood and chronic polyneuropathies. That means when there is a long standing neuropathy, there will be deformity and trophic changes. What is that deformity due to? The pescavus or high arch foot. Why should they develop pescavus or high arch foot? The disproportionate weakness of the pre-tibial and the peroneal muscles and the unopposed action of the calf muscles results in plantar deviation and weakness of the intrinsic foot muscles results in claw foot and pescavus when the process is less severe. So high arch foot develops because of the disproportionate weakness of the pre-tibial and peroneal muscles and the unopposed action of the calf muscles resulting in plantar deviation and the weakness of the intrinsic foot muscles resulting in claw foot and pescavus when the process is less severe. Then we have the kyphoscoliosis which is because the unequal weakness of the paravertebral muscles on the two sides of the spine during the early development which leads to the kyphoscoliosis. Autonomic dysfunction. Then we have the anhydrosis that is loss of sweating and then we have orthostatic hypotension. You check the blood pressure on lying down and then you check the blood pressure on standing. There should be a fall of at least 20 systolic and 10 diastolic which indicates orthostatic hypotension. These two are the most frequent manifestations of autonomic failure and predominate in certain types of polyneuropathy. What are they? Anhydrosis, loss of sweating and orthostatic hypotension. Fine. We have done, we have seen anhydrosis and orthostatic hypotension. So we know it is autonomic neuropathy. Then in autonomic neuropathy, we want to know whether the parasympathetic component is affected or the sympathetic component is affected. How do we find out? If the parasympathetic component is affected, there is resting tachycardia. If the sympathetic component gets affected, there is exercise intolerance. Why is there resting tachycardia in parasympathetic dysfunction? Generally, during the resting state and digestive state, parasympathetic is more active. So, parasympathetic is more active in rest and digest. Whereas, during fight or flight, when you are afraid and when you are running off, the sympathetic system is more active. So, the sympathetic system is more active during fight or flight. So, during fight or flight when you are running, the sympathetic system is more active. But when you are in a state of rest and in a state of digestion, the parasympathetic is more active. So, during the resting state, parasympathetic is more active. So, when there is parasympathetic dysfunction, there is a resting tachycardia. Parasympathetic causes bradycardia and sympathetic causes tachycardia. So, during resting state, parasympathetic is more active. So, the heart rate is normal. But when there is parasympathetic dysfunction, even during resting state, since there is parasympathetic dysfunction, it results in tachycardia, known as a resting tachycardia. So, resting tachycardia indicates that there is a parasympathetic component being affected. So, when it comes to exercise, when we exercise, the heart rate has to increase so that more blood flows to the muscles. So, the sympathetic system becomes more active. So, during exercise, the sympathetic system becomes more active, increases the heart rate so that the more blood flows to the muscles, so we are able to tolerate the exercise well. But when there is a sympathetic dysfunction, heart rate is not able to increase, commensurate to the increase in the exercise. So there is a less blood going to the muscles, the, mus the flow of blood to the muscles does not increase proportionately to the exercise and therefore relatively less blood flows to the muscles so they will develop severe pain so they will develop exercise intolerance so resting tachycardia indicates parasympathetic dysfunction and exercise intolerance indicates as a sympathetic dysfunction so when we approach a case of autonomic dysfunction first we need to know whether there is an autonomic dysfunction or not so when there is anhydrosis or orthostatic hypotension it indicates autonomic dysfunction once we know there is an autonomic dysfunction, we want to know whether the parasympathetic component is affected or sympathetic component is affected. If there is a resting tachycardia, that indicates the parasympathetic component is affected. If there is exercise intolerance, it indicates that there is a sympathetic component being affected. So, these are all the wonderful concepts of the symptomatology of peripheral neuropathy. The other important concepts of the clinical neurology, I put in a book called Exam-Oriented Clinical Neurology written by me, Dr. S. Srinivas. 
published by White Army. This book will be very useful for students appearing for clinical neurology exams. So, if interested, this could be this book could be purchased. The other book I wrote is Focused Neurology, written by me, Dr. S. Srinivas. This contains all the essential elements of theoretical knowledge, theoretical neurology, put it in a question answer format. This book will be very useful for students appearing for Viva OC and Orals. So, if interested, this book could be purchased. This book is available from all leading booksellers, including Amazon. So, if interested, this book could be purchased online. I hope you have enjoyed listening to these wonderful concepts of symptomatology of peripheral neuropathy. If you have uh, uh, liked it, please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. As I said, there are going to be 50 episodes of Prime Neurology. We've just done, we've just now done with another episode of Prime Neurology. Kindly listen to all these 50 episodes of Prime Neurology. If one listens to all these 50 episodes of Prime Neurology, one would have acquired a good knowledge of neurology. If you have enjoyed listening to these concepts, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dr. Srinivas Medical Concepts, which is India's leading neurology educational YouTube channel and my page, Dr. Srinivas Concepts. Thank you. Bye.